You are watching DHTV from California State University to Mingus Hills. Uh, welcome everybody, I'm Bill Allen, I'm President and CEO of the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, this is our sixth year of doing these Future Forum series with our partners here at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, uh, and we're just delighted to be in this partnership six years running now. Uh, I want to encourage all of you to be a part of this morning's program. We'll have some opportunities for Q&A after our panel, but you can start right away uh, being part of our online conversation at our socials, uh, at LAEDC on Twitter and Facebook. Use the hashtag LAEDC Future Forum. Join in the online conversation this morning uh, about this industry, about the program that we'll present to you this morning, about this wonderful university and its ties to the esports industry. We really want you all to be an interactive part of the program with us today. For those of you who don't know, LADC is Southern California's premier economic development leadership organization. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary, and we're focused right now on reinventing our regional economy into one that is even more fast uh, growing, faster growing, uh, more robust, more inclusive, more sustainable, and more resilient. And we've done this historically by uh, investing in key industries that represent growth opportunities. Uh, and the industry we're talking about today is actually an evolution of a number of industries in which LA has had a leadership position. The entertainment industry, the professional sports industry, the gaming industry uh, have all coalesced to create this fast-growing esports industry about which you're gonna hear some exciting things this morning. Like any other industry, it went through challenges and disruptions in the pandemic, uh, but they were very creative in their solutions to adapt to that, uh, and they are looking forward to a very bright future here in Los Angeles uh, and throughout the world. So we look forward to hearing from our wonderful speakers this morning. Uh, just as we have in the past five years uh, together, we've explored uh, industries like cybersecurity and life sciences and digital media and zero emission vehicles and autonomous vehicles and so many aspects of our rapidly evolving economy in the region. And this morning we do so again so that all of you who are in the industry can understand more about where your industry is going. Those of you who are interested in joining this industry can have a clearer sense of what this industry represents to our region and to the world. And those of you in our education community, particularly at universities like Cal State Dominguez Hills that is so committed to preparing its students to play leading roles in the industries of the future. All of you in the academic world can understand the nuances of where these industries are going and adapt your programs and curriculums and, and advice to your students to help them facilitate pathways into meaningful careers within these industries. Uh, we couldn't do this without partners like California State University at Dominguez Hills. This is the sixth year they have been our partner, and they were our founding partners. They shared with us the vision of bringing this information to the public and to these constituents, not only in industry and education, but also in local government, so that we can create hospitable environments that can nurture the growth of fast emerging and rapidly evolving industries such as esports. Uh, Cal State Dominguez Hills is an incredibly diverse, welcoming environment, uh, creating pathways for the future of our students who will be playing leadership roles in our communities, in our industries of the future. The talent development pipeline here in Los Angeles is a strong one, but is a complex one to manage because of the extraordinary diversity of industries that exist in the LA regional economy. And we're particularly grateful for leadership of this university that understands the importance of connecting now, the leaders in these industries with the faculty so that they can shape the programs on an ongoing basis to be relevant to what is needed today and tomorrow in these industries. We also have as our uh, featured sponsor today, our partners at the global law firm of Nixon Peabody, um, who are sponsoring this event because they have such a strong practice in the esports industry, and you'll hear from the leader of their practice, uh, who will be the moderator of the program. Uh, but before we introduce uh, Irene and, and hear from our great panel, I want to bring up my partner who is uh, the 11th president of the California State University campus, and I just want to tell you how impressed I've been in working closely with him. He is a member of not only the board, but the executive committee of the LADC. He helps shape our work and that of so many other civic partners in this region for the benefit of his students, for which he's an incredible champion for his students and his faculty and the campus staff here. And so would you join me in welcoming the 11th president of the California State University of Dominguez Hills, Dr. Thomas Barham.
Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Oh, wait a minute. I thought we were in the Toro Nation. Let me try that again. Good morning. First of all, universities never get by without strategic partners. And one of the best I have seen since I have been here now, what, three and a half years, is partnering with the LAEDC under the leadership of my good friend Bill Allen. He does not get enough credit for what he does in this entire region. So I want to take a moment and see if we can't just acknowledge him for the special person that he is. As Bill said, I am Dr. Thomas Parham. I'm the president of California State University, Dominguez Hills, what we call the Toro Nation. And I'm honored to serve as both a sponsor and a co-host of this LEDC's Future Forum. Now, today's forum marks an important milestone in our return to campus. So I'm loving the fact, and you see people kind of giddy outside and you know, eating the reception of food this morning. But it's the first time this forum has been held in person for over a year. That sounds like an applause line to me, right? We're glad to be out and about. And I'm grateful, I think, to everyone who's worked so diligently to ensure that our campus is clean, safe, healthy space for our visitors today. So I want to start out by thanking, first of all, our uh, staff at both the LAEDC, uh, Shane and that team, I know you are somewhere managing logistics, as well as our ceremonies and event folk, Marilyn McPolin and her team. So if you would give them a round of applause for really the help that they provided us. And again, I want you to keep your hands together for our Toro Pet Band. It's nice to see them, led by our own uh, Chica Inoue, who provided our introductory music today, certainly appropriately for a forum on the topic of esports. They entertained us with selections of themes from many of the popular video games. Now, in thanking all of us today and these appropriate forums, I think, one of the reasons why a university would partner with the LEDC is because it is about trying to empower this region and really seizing our power, not running from it. Power, my friends, has nothing to do with military might. It's not who has the biggest, baddest police force or even the most money. Power is always the ability to define reality and to make other people respond to that definition as if it were their own. The power of this collaboration is we plan to not simply follow the leader, but to set the curve. And if we can help frame the discourse on what people ought to be talking about in healthcare, in bitcoins, in space technology, in transportation, in electronic transportation, whatever it is, and now in esports, then it helps to, I think, create and cultivate the garden that allows your own creativity and innovation to be able to grow. So we're proud that CSUDH continues to be, I think, a presenting sponsor in highlighting the challenges and opportunities that we are providing with as we provide you with a glimpse into the future that we'll be sharing. Now, as Bill said, the focus on today's forum is on a topic that is near and dear to me in esports. And I was sharing with some of our guests in the lobby. Anyone on campus can attest that I am probably one of the most vocal advocates and energetic supporters of our CSUDH esports uh, association, but also just esports generally. And people ask, why would a university president be engaged in esports? Because I'm not even a gamer. Sound like a different space to me. But my connection with esports extends back to my days, way back at University of California, Irvine, where I served as vice chancellor, working with people like good friends, like Gerald Solomon and the folk, who was a tremendous support for us there. But I joined with students and Mark Deppy when they came to see me as the vice chancellor and said, do we have an idea for you? And as most folk have clubs and organizations that are 25, 30, 40 big, and Irvine at that point had what, 653 clubs and organizations, imagine everybody's got 20, 30 folk. Esports folk are sitting on three and 400 students. And then they presented me with books where they were showing me competition arenas like the Staples Center, 
simultaneously going on what's happening in Korea, simultaneously happening what's happening in Shanghai, simultaneously happening what's happening in Germany, and all around the world they are filling up arenas at 30,000 people a space talking about this esports thing, and I went, wow. So for me, it's been a phenomenal journey to be able to invite them to say, uh, but we got to remember this is an academic institution, and so we have to make sure we follow those protocols and rituals, I think, that are important to us. So I'm glad to say that our campus has now embraced it. And it was very organic as we pulled together the deans and other folk and really tried to talk to them about why this particular endeavor is important. And in just over a few years, over 500 current students and alumni have joined and participated in esports through our association. And by the way, this Cal State University Dominguez Hills teams has won not one, not two, Ruben, but three esports championships, which is pretty doggone phenomenal for a new program. Now, in partnership with gaming powerhouse ViewSonic, our new eSports incubator lab is scheduled to open next semester, and we'll be uh, helping to bring our university's vision of eSports to fruition. By the way, it's not opening in the student center. It is not opening in the gym. It is opening in the library. Let me say that again, in the library, because we consider it to be an academic aspect. Our eSports program is centered in four pillars not just competition. Competition is certainly one of those, but it also is centered in our academics and research. It's also centered in our sense of community, but also centered in the context of entertainment, so that we want those people to feel comfortable, even if they don't know how to turn on the eSports machine. We want them to feel comfortable coming into the arena to learn aspects of that. But why is that important? Because any time you can teach a student to create a story behind an avatar and improve their writing, any time we can teach them to toss a projectile to either build a city or to destroy an opponent and know that there's some math and science in that, we can help students develop those assets that will then better make them able to manage the rigors of a university curriculum in this space. That is really what esports is about. For us, esports is a strategy, not just an outcome. Let me say that again. It is a strategy and not just an outcome. And so we are enthusiastic partners, not only in this future forum, but in this esports endeavor we're about to take on today, because we know the potential that this has to be able to empower not only a campus, but to be able to impact the trajectory of our students and push them towards success. And so the innovative individuals who are joining us today are uniquely positioned, I think, to speak on how esports industry is growing and thriving, not just in Southern California, but around the world. And so today, as Bill said, you'll hear from industry leaders and speak on their work in the realm of esports, whether it's behind the scenes, planning events, or on the front lines of virtual battles as an esports athlete. We'll also hear about the economic impact the esports industry is expected to have here in Southern California and this South Bay and South LA region, and how its popularity is growing. And it's my hope that today's forum will provide a valuable insight into the world of esports that many of you might not know. And I'm confident that by the end of the day, you'll be as excited as I am about the opportunities inherent in this esports endeavor. And so, whether the realm is technology and innovation, workforce development, or pure entertainment, esports, I believe, is destined to be a major factor in the university experience going forward. And so, our university is dedicated to the success. And on behalf of our senior administration, faculty, staff, and the 17,000 students here in the Toro Nation and our over 105,000 alumni, I simply want to welcome you to the campus of California State University, Dominguez Hills. And as they say, let's get the show on the road and let's get the cracking. Dr. Parham, as always, for your inspiring words. Uh, Dr. Parham and I are both so excited to see all of you here today because you represent the opportunity for us to further strengthen and diversify and deepen the talent pool for this industry, which in all of our industries is the lifeblood of industry growth, the creative talent and innovative talent that represents uh, 
what these industries are today and what they can be in the future. So thank you for all being here. We're also particularly excited to have our keynote speaker and each of our panelists because they are real leaders in this industry. And I'll start with a brief introduction of our keynote speaker, uh, Matt Edelman. Uh, Matt started his career as an entertainment industry executive, has been involved with Marvel Comics and helped establish Marvel.com. Uh, he was involved in a series of successful early stage companies. He joined William Morris Endeavor IMG and led their digital operations and marketing solutions group. And today he is the chief commercial officer of Super League Gaming, uh, a global leader in the mission to bring live and digital esports entertainment and experiences directly to the more than two billion everyday gamers around the world. Super League Gaming operates premium city versus city amateur esports leagues, produces thousands of live competitive and social gaming events around the world, and publishes multiple platforms of content celebrating the love of play on its websites and major platforms, including YouTube, Twitch, and Instagram. Matt oversees the company's revenue, marketing, content, community, live event, and business development activities, and we're just so pleased that he's here this morning with us to share some keynote opening remarks. Please welcome Matt Edelman. Thank you very much, uh, Bill and, and Dr. Parham. That was a fantastic um, introduction. I am quite impressed with what the university is doing and its commitment to esports. Um, and it's clearly uh, one of the universities that's leading the charge in the collegiate space. Um, so yes, my name is Matt Edelman. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer and EVP of Operations at Super League Gaming. Uh, I've been in the media business for about 25 years, the last four and a half at Super League. Super League started off as a fully focused esports company. We were creating amateur leagues uh, for a variety of game titles and, and segments of the gaming uh, population. Uh, for young gamers, you could have thought of us at the time as really being the little league of esports. For older gamers, maybe the adult softball version. Um, across the board, we were really trying to support the competitive journey for players, uh, depending on where they wanted to end up. As our business got going, we committed more to our digital presence and to creating content that was featuring the emotional joy that was occurring in the competitions we hosted around the country. And that decision to lean in to digital and content ended up being quite um, advantageous when COVID hit and we were out of the events business. Our company has evolved considerably over the last uh, two years. Uh, really, the big change is that creators across the gaming landscape have become the center of our universe. Uh, we still have an esports business, but we have um, grown uh, well beyond that. And we've done that through empowering technologies. We've done that through original content, owned and operated platforms in the digital presence, and also through creating gameplay experiences increasingly in metaverse platforms. Across it all, it's important to us in the way that we show up in front of gamers. And there is an ethos of how we do that. Uh, we're going to have a quick video here that speaks to that ethos, and then I'll spend some time talking about gaming and esports as an industry and how that looks currently in Los Angeles. Cheers to the ones that we got. Cheers to the wish you were here, but you're not, because the drinks bring back all the memories of everything we've been through. Toast to the ones that are today. Toast to the ones that we lost on the way. Cause the drinks bring back all the memories And the memories bring back memories Bring back your Okay, so uh, we've got some slides here to talk about gaming in lovely and usually sunny Southern California. 
Um, we can move to the next slide. The, uh, the truth is that LA is the nation's capital of gaming and esports, without question. We have representation from many of the biggest publishers in the world, including being the headquarters for some. Gold standard of game developers and some of the most remarkable games that have been published in history have been designed here. And in esports, we have the largest collection of teams in the country and possibly the world, including some of the most successful. If we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna start with the heavies, the publishers. The publishers hold the majority of the cards in gaming. That may or may not be entirely obvious, but because they own the IP, they have the ability to really dictate a lot of what happens in gaming and esports. The good news is, unlike some of the other industries over time who have sort of struggled to embrace digital, embrace new technologies, and figure out a way to engage consumers without worrying about their intellectual property, gaming has embraced it and is very, the publisher is very permissive in what they allow their consumer audiences to do um, with their IP and that has helped fuel their growth. Activision, Blizzard, Riot, two of the most successful game publishers in history. Not sure if you knew, but Konami and Capcom and Square Enix chose LA for their US headquarters. Some of the most interesting game publishers that have been created in a more modern way of thinking about game publishing started here in LA, Scopely, Jam City. Um, and of course, the uh, publishing divisions of the major studios are based here where their studios are based. So it is an impressive collection and there are billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars generated by what these publishers do. Next slide. So Dr. Parham um, and, uh, and Bill both mentioned the creativity of Los Angeles. Well, that creativity is generally thought of as applying to the entertainment business where we have one of the most remarkable and innovative communities in the world. Well, the good news is it has permeated gaming and it has brought us some of the most talented game designers and developers and marketers um, that you will find anywhere. And as a result, a number of remarkable studios, uh, DICE, Insomniac Games, Naughty Dog, and, and many, many others, including independent, and independent studios and studios that sit within the game publishers, um, have been created here. And these are some of the games they've produced. Uh, if you are a gamer, you know these titles. If you're not a gamer, you know some of these titles. They generate more than I would guess about 200 million to 300 million um, monthly active users across these titles um, in any given month of any given year, and that's been happening for a couple of decades. When you talk about esports, the competitors, we have a lock on the market. There are a couple of other cities in the country who think they're in the esports capital but they aren't. This is where esports lives and breathes and emanates. This is where the excitement happens. This is where the leadership occurs. And you can see the teams that are represented here. They were founded here for a reason. This is where gaming, the heart of gaming lives in the US. And there's really no other place that they could imagine setting up their headquarters and growing their businesses and having the influence on the industry that they've been able to have. Next slide, you'll see something that really represents a significant difference between esports and traditional sports, which you probably already know. It's been talked about uh, many times over the past several years, but an esports team org owns multiple esports teams. It would kind of be like if one company owned the Lakers and the Dodgers and the Kings and the Clippers. Um, that's how esports team orgs are set up. And in Los Angeles, between the highest level of competition, the professional teams, and the academy and challenger rosters uh, that also sit within these esports team organizations, we have a remarkable representation. 11 different League of Legends teams, again, at the pro and uh, academy levels, 11 Valorant teams, six Apex Legends and PUBG teams, just about every major esport and many of the 
less than major esports have rosters here in Los Angeles. I think one of the very few that I noticed isn't on this list, although it might exist, is uh, Madden teams. Um, but otherwise, we cover it all. These are the rosters that are out there competing. Um, usually, um, the players are actually a little younger than collegiate age, uh, and then they continue through uh, their college years. But uh, this just represents how powerful um, the opportunity for being a top competitive athlete in uh, the industry can be um, in Los Angeles. So what's the impact? The impact of all this activity is um, remarkable economic development, remarkable growth, remarkable contributions to the community, tens of thousands of jobs. Tens of thousands of jobs in LA are available and active in gaming and esports. Billions of dollars created by the companies. The economic impact in Los Angeles itself often doesn't consider all of the real estate that these companies either buy or lease. The development of those properties doesn't necessarily consider all of the um, uh, food that is served at lunch uh, for the people who work at these companies. The impact is considerable in ways that aren't always obvious. And in terms of size, even right now, just as an example, there are more than 390 open jobs listed on Riot Games' website. 390 for one publisher in this particular week. More than 20 of those are in esports, by the way. So the contribution that these companies make to the economic progress of Los Angeles is considerable. In looking at what's happening in gaming in particular, um, the growth drivers for the industry that we at Super League have paid the closest attention to have also informed how our company has evolved and where we are focused. I'm gonna talk about those growth drivers in general, but also then give you a little bit of an update as to where Super League plays as it relates to these different impacting factors. So first, you've probably heard references to the creator economy. I like to think of it as an explosion of the creator economy over the past multiple years. One in 150 people on this planet consider themselves a creator, and I'm sure that in this room uh, there are many more than one in 150. But think about it, if you go to Ralph's at the end of a work day and you spend about 30, 40 minutes there, you're definitely passing a creator, and in Los Angeles you're probably passing about 20. The influencer marketing business, actually, I saw a report this morning that makes this number um, sort of seem small. Influencer marketing was reported in something I saw today as a $13 billion industry expected to grow to $15 billion in 2022. $15 billion spent on influencer marketing, that's one-third of the entire movie business, just on influencer marketing. Now, not all of that is gaming, but gaming has been a leading category in influencer marketing and in the creator economy for its entire existence, and in many estimates, it is the leading category. At Super League, we have leaned into the creator, uh, creator economy um, because it is through creators that uh, we are able to reach gamers. We don't own the game titles. We don't own the intellectual property that drives the passion of players. Well, as a result, we've created uh, opportunities to support the um, creators across multiple components of the industry. So whether it's streamers or YouTubers, Minecraft server creators, Roblox developers, or even everyday players who consider themselves creators because when they play games, they create highlights that are extremely fun to watch, and they share those on social media, and we support them with a series of, of social media accounts where we can celebrate their gameplay. Um, and so our view is that continuing to fuel the creator economy in gaming will be one of the components of the engines of growth for the industry going forward.
I have to say it this way, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook, oh my. Hopefully that means you get the image. Um, and so uh, the consumption of live and on-demand content in gaming is extraordinary. Nine billion hours, nine billion hours of live content being viewed in Q2, which is up 3x from just two years ago. If nine billion were miles instead of hours, represents 18,000 round trips between the Earth and the moon. It's a lot of minutes. A hundred billion hours. A hundred billion hours. That's just, what does that number even mean? A hundred billion hours of content viewed, gaming content viewed on YouTube in 2020. Speaking of trips to the moon, if a hundred billion hours were dollars, it would still only represent one third of Elon Musk's net worth. <laughs> the consumption of content creates opportunity, creates opportunity for companies that are trying to be active in gaming and esports. It's opportunity that we also have seen, and it's represented a big part of what we do. Some of the technology that we offer to streamers helps them multicast across these platforms and others. And as a result, the content that runs through our system reaches 110 million viewers in the US, which is a remarkable number, and it's one of the reasons that our company's been able to grow during COVID. We also help YouTubers monetize uh, their channels through an, an innovative ad product. And again, it's our view that if we can support creators with the distribution and creation of content, we can help drive growth in the industry. So another driver of growth, brand support, brand support of what's happening in gaming. It's not as obvious necessarily as to why it drives growth. I'll talk a bit about that. In-game advertising has been around for a long time. If you are into classic games or you are as old as I am, which I don't think is very old, but compared to people who are here on campus, it's old. Um, uh, game name, named Tapper right here uh, that you can see had an in-game billboard. Well, if you are a gamer and you're playing Madden or you're playing Forza, or you're playing Grand Theft Auto or FIFA, you're seeing in-game billboards from brands all over the place. And that makes it a contributor to growth. A $54 billion business, a $56 billion business by 2024, um, that's, a, that's another huge number, again, bigger than the movie business. Well, one of the things that has become most exciting is that brands are now getting involved in gaming in a way that is quite distinct from what's been happening in the past, which is really just these um, billboard advertisement type of integrations. Um, and that's, that's happening in many respects because of the pace of growth in metaverse environments. Metaverse is a, the word of the moment. Um, it's an overused word, but it's an exciting word. Um, and there is not one metaverse. I don't know really how to think about what Facebook announced, but that's not what I think of as the metaverse. Um, the metaverse right now is really a, a series of microverses, um, and it's microverses that are immersive 3D environments where user-generated content is inspiring incredible levels of gameplay and communication and socialization and creativity. And, and that is where brands are starting to spend a great deal of their attention. And there's, there's one important reason why, and that is because the smart brands realize that the metaverse over the next decade is going to be as impactful across culture as social media has been over the past decade. But I don't think it's gonna be the social media companies who are going to lead us over the next 10 years in this space. I think it's gonna be the gaming industry. And that's quite exciting. And if we go to the next slide, you will start to get a sense of you know, what we see happening and are actively, actively contributing to in 
um, the space where brands integrate with games. Roblox, a platform that has 226 million monthly active users. 226 million people a month are in Roblox. If you're a parent here, you're spending a lot of money on Roblox. Brands are getting into the space in exciting ways. They are building worlds. Vans built a world where you can get on a skateboard as a player and cruise an incredible um, environment and, and do tricks and earn points and be competitive but also have fun. We helped Nickelodeon and Paramount Plus integrate in one of the most uh, popular games in Roblox for the launch of the Patrick Star series, and the characters showed up in the game. Um, we have uh, just yesterday, uh, Ralph Lauren announced that they are going to put um, in-game apparel, digital apparel, into the space. Um, Gucci sold a bag for $4,000 in Roblox. Um, Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Minecraft, 126 million monthly active users. All of these brands have been in Minecraft. This image is actually Etihad Stadium, which is where Manchester City plays. We created that stadium for them um, in Minecraft. Um, the brand commitment here is equally as impressive. Next slide. Fortnite, another player in the brand space. Um, they are almost a complete metaverse environment. I think they're going to go further in that direction. They're not quite there the way that Roblox and Minecraft are, uh, but the brands are there as well, as well, you know, and you've heard about the music concerts. Um, Ariana Grande and Travis Scott, you should be thinking of them as brands, not just performers, and they're active. Next slide. A smaller but mighty metaverse environment and Animal Crossing brands are also spending a lot of time there. So if we go to the next slide, what, what this really represents is the fact that we live and are seeing the equivalent of a fidgetal world. And what's important to take into account as it relates to gaming and interesting in terms of where esports may be headed, um, Gen Z does not distinguish between physical life and digital life. There's no break. It's all one life. And if you're a brand and you're in gaming and you're not thinking of communicating and connecting with consumers digitally, you don't have a chance of connecting with them in the physical world. So what this has created, in my view, is a circle of trust. It's a circle of trust between the different constituents in the gaming space. And you can see the circle here, I won't read it, but if you look at the numbers, gamers are spending more than two work days, more than two and a half school days, connected to gaming and gaming content every single week. And all of that activity has created a $180 billion global business. Going back to the movie business, I didn't say the number, 45 billion. So let's bring this back to esports. Next slide. Maybe the next slide? There we go. Um, actually, we'll go to the next one. So esports is projected right now to be a $1 billion business. It's a little fuzzy, right? You see some fuzzy lines around that circle. It's a little unclear what revenue is being counted. Is it the revenue that's generated by teams that get you know, uh, uh, paid when they win, they win prizes? Is it just the sponsorship revenue? Um, we have a lot of work to do as an industry to really identify the impact of esports. What's the impact of esports on the sale of either games or in-game purchases? What's the impact on esports, as I mentioned earlier, on real estate in the communities where esports is active? Um, so I think the billion dollars has remarkable potential and is not yet well defined. If we can go to the next slide. One of the reasons I'm pretty certain of that is there's a lot of investor co commitment to what's happening in esports. You're seeing teams be valued at con team organizations being valued at considerable levels, and there is no shortage of enthusiasm in looking at how to continue to support the growth in the space. Next slide. 
So why are investors supporting this? Why are they putting money in? Inspiring demand? Esports teams are inspiring demand from consumers for games, for content, for events, for fandom, for merchandise, and that demand is contributing to growth. Next slide. Esports teams are also creating connections. They're creating connections between players, between players and, um, and the pro, uh, I'm sorry, gamers and the pro players. That connection, that fandom, that bond that you form when you get excited about a team, when you aspire to play like the athlete that you see um, is a remarkable um, contributor to the excitement in the category. And then finally, esports teams, the esports industry, and this is something we take seriously at Super League, are empowering journeys. Empowering journeys for players to think about what it means to be competitive, to be competitive casually, to be comp competitive seriously, um, to have aspirations to make esports a part of your career in one form or another, whether you're a shoutcaster who's calling the action, whether you are a producer of content, whether you are a marketer, whether you're designing merchandise. I think that's one of the reasons investors are putting their money into this category. And, and where that leaves me is back at Super League, we see empowering journeys. You can go to the final slide. Uh, we see empowering journeys as a key component of who we are, sitting at the intersection of content creation in the gaming space and the creator economy and the metaverse. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Matt, that was absolutely fantastic. Talk about setting the stage for a great panel of experts. I, I really want to acknowledge Matt could have spent this whole time talking about Super League Gaming, which is an amazing enterprise, but he really gave us a tremendous overview of this industry here in Los Angeles uh, and its worldwide impact. And those numbers are astounding, Matt. Thank you for sharing all of that context for our conversation now. Uh, I want to remind you all about our LEDC socials and our hope that you'll be part of the interactive conversation today uh, at LADC at Twitter and Facebook and using the hashtag LADC Future Forum. We have a great panel of uh, industry leaders uh, that we want to bring up and I want to ask uh, our partner in today's forum uh, to make the introductions for you, but I want to first make an introduction of her. Uh, Irene Scholtedevosian is the uh, a senior associate and leader of the esports industry and gaming practice at Nixon Peabody. Nixon Peabody, as I mentioned before, is a global law firm with expertise in a number of key industry sectors, very strong presence here in Los Angeles. Irene herself is an experienced trial attorney and litigator representing clients in high stakes litigation in state and federal courts and also helping provide comprehensive advice so that they can avoid litigation. Uh, she is the Esports and gaming industry group founder at Nixon Peabody, and one of the, it is one of the first dedicated esports groups among top 100 law firms in the nation. Uh, she's a lifelong gamer, incredibly passionate about the industry, thrilled to be part of its ongoing evolution, and she is a significant part of its evolution, partnering with so many esports and gaming clients, counseling them on a full range of legal matters. Uh, she launched the Professional Women in Gaming Network in Southern California and was appointed the Vice President of the Esports Bar Association. So I can't think of anybody better to lead us through the next part of our program. Please welcome Irene Scholl Tedevosian. Irene. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. And if you had doubts about how big the esports ecosystem is, just look at the attorney moderating the panel, right? Um, let me have my panelists come up and we can do introductions. I also want um, a round of applause for the presentation that Matt just did. That's one of the best explanations of the esports ecosystem that I have seen, and I'm at a lot of these conferences and panels. So thank you, Matt, for that. Okay, I'm gonna do things um, just a little bit differently. So I'm gonna have um, each of the panelists introduce themselves and answer a question. So I will call on each panelist one by one, 
and they'll both introduce themselves and answer a question. And I think it'll go hand in hand because the question will be, what is your or your company's or organization's role in the esports ecosystem? I think this helps explain just how broad it is. So let's start with Gerald Solomon, who's the executive director of North American Scholastic Esports Federation. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you for having me. Um, our world is a little bit different. We're known as NASEF, N-A-S-E-F.org, if you're interested. And we look at esports as basically the proverbial Trojan horse. It's the pathway for career and curriculum development, skill force development, especially around STEM and STEAM education. Um, I spent 13 plus years running a foundation called the Samueli Foundation. That's where I got to know Dr. Parham. And it's great to be here because I think it was 2019 where I came and spoke to Dr. Parham and a group of educators and said, hey, I think we have an idea here that you're familiar with at UCI that we can bring to Cal State Dominguez Hills. Basically what we do is we provide curriculum development and training for middle school students, career tech pathways, and high school students, um, not only around the country where we reach 20,000 students in over 2,000 schools, but we also, in partnership with the U.S. State Department, do this in 41 countries around the world. And because we were philanthropically developed, our entire curriculum, approved by the Department of Ed in California, is 100% free to students all over the world. So we look at things a little bit differently. We're about learning, education, social-emotional development, and opportunity. All right, Graham Cross, founding member of the Digital Gaming and Esports Practice, and Erst and Young, my accountant counterpart. <laughs> That's right, appreciate it, thank you. Uh, nice to be here, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Pranam, and thank you, Bill. This has been very interesting so far. Thank you, Matt, for that keynote. That was amazing. Um, so at Ernst & Young, yeah, people think of us as accountants, right? We're tax people, we're audit people. Ernst & Young's had a big effort the last few years, so we actually play in a different space. They brought someone like me in. I work in innovation, in futures, in digital transformations. And so what we do is work on the consulting side and the advisory side uh, to work with the different players within the ecosystem of esports and gaming more broadly and also with other traditional and different sectors and large organizations to help them work out how they can actually be part of that ecosystem or how they can sort of tap into new growth opportunities from that. Uh, so we have a lot of different and unexpected projects going on with, with the, the space and the industry and excited to be here and talk with these great panelists about it. Yeah, just to, to add some more um, color to that about how the professional services surrounding the industry, right? You need your accountants, you need your wealth managers, you need your outside consultants. Um, Matt put up some companies there. We represent some of those companies in the legal space and are often communicating with our professional adjuncts like the accountants, uh, the Ernst & Youngs of the world about how to provide services to these esports and gaming companies. Next up, we have Max Bass, Vice President of Marketing at the esports organization, The Immortals. Uh, hi, thank you, and thanks for having me. Um, our role in esports is as an organization. Um, we own and operate three different teams that compete in League of Legends, Wild Rift, and Valorant. All happen to be games from Riot, the publisher. Um, and we're really trying to build a business in this industry, which I think is an interesting challenge because of a lot of what Matt covered. But we're, you know, we're expanding into the creator economy to try to try to diversify the assets that we can sell and grow the audience that we can command. And so um, it's an interesting challenge with a lot of our peers here in Los Angeles trying to do the same thing. And we're doing a lot of interesting things to try to distinguish ourselves. But I won't bore you with all of that right now. Next up, we have Alex Warren Carrasco, president of the Esports Association here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so at Cal State Dominguez Hills Esports Association, uh, we are that pipeline. We are the consumers, we're the competitors, and we're the eventual uh, workforce. And so being able to be a part of this association is so incredible. And I'm so grateful that we're getting our eSports Incubator Lab where we can have a physical space to build this passion in students and uh, continue to push the eSports industry forward. And Matt, you all met at our keynote. But Matt, 
since you were so humble and not talking too much about Super League Gaming, why don't you tell us more about what Super League Gaming is doing? Sure. Uh, just really briefly, as you heard, we have evolved into being a company that uh, reaches gamers largely through creators and builds uh, audiences that we believe are increasingly compelling to brands in order for brands to connect to this important segment. And, and what that looks like for us, as I mentioned, 110 million viewers of content that runs through our platforms. Uh, we reach about 70 million players in metaverse environments, particularly Roblox and Minecraft. Uh, and the content that we produce, package, and also power through our technology generates about 10 billion views a year. So, it's, uh, with all of us being in the industry for some time, it's been interesting to see the evolution of the industry. And so I'm gonna start with Max first. Um, and he and I were talking about, you know, the Immortals, which is one of the premier esports organizations out there. And, you know, when this started, Esports organizations like the Immortals used to call themselves exclusively esports teams, and that that's quite changed. So, can you talk a little bit about that in in how that ecosystem and ev evolution has changed for the Immortals? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Immortals started in 2015, um, and the 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 I guess impetus for that launch was that we we secured a spot in the League of Legends championship series, the, the Riot's biggest league. Um, and we competed there for a few years and then we exited that league for um, various reasons. Um, and we actually earned a spot back in 2020. And upon arriving back, Immortals had a League of Legends team. But we looked around, I mean, it didn't, didn't take much competitive survey, but we looked, our competitors, 100 Thieves is in Valorant, they're in League of Legends, they're in um, numerous other games. I'm not going to list all of them. TSM is in, is in um, you know, Valorant and, and League, and um, I, I think they're also in CSGO and a number of other games. And so we're, we're really interested in how, how are we growing and expanding the, the, the games that we're competing in. Uh, we're not the Lakers in that we can only compete in one game, we can compete in multiple. And um, we see Riot as a fantastic partner, and we, you know, we're looking at the viewership behind League of Legends Worlds, for example. League of Legends is, is one of the biggest esports, if not the biggest esport in the world. The world's uh, viewership from this past November and October, I think, peaked at 73 million, um, and had an average average minute average of like uh, average minute viewership of like I think 30 million. Um, and so that, that's a league that, that is seeing viewership that's, that's beyond professional sports leagues in some regard and just massive. And so we have a team in there and that's a huge asset for us. We're looking to build around that. Um, for example, League of, uh, Riot just launched Wild Rift. It's a mobile version of League of Legends, very similar. For us, we entered that almost immediately with one of the biggest creators in the game and that's a way for us to funnel fans down to our League of Legends team. We're also competing in Valorant. Valorant just had a competition, the VCT, this past summer peak viewership, almost a million people. And that's a game that's under two years old, I believe. Um, and so we're kind of eyeing the space and, and really understanding where, in the same way that we approach marketing channels, where we look at where the attention is and that's where we're putting our, putting our action and, and investing, we're looking at esports in the same way. And the attention and viewership, um, it's not always the same people playing Valorant as it is playing League of Legends, as it is playing Call of Duty versus FIFA. There are a lot of different games and a lot of different niches. but. Where there is scale, um, and you're beginning to see that at the esports level, at the gaming level, it's kind of it's even bigger. Gaming is the larger circle; esports is the smaller one. Um, where, where there is scale, we're really really finding ways to invest that are interesting, and I think that um, I'm excited about the potential of the three games that we're in currently, and, and eager to join some more. I'm going to open it up for the rest of the panelists to talk about how esports has have you seen it involved, particularly within your companies and uh, the people you work with. And um, Alex, whenever you speak up, I'd like to hear about how the student association started and evolved because that's something we've been seeing across the esports ecosystem too, is the building and expansion of universities and student ecosystems. I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, so the expansion has really been ignited significantly by, unfortunately, the pandemic for us around academics. I'll give you an example of where and how it became uh, a trigger for growth at an uh, exponential uh, level. We were contacted by the public school system in Mexico City at the beginning of COVID. 
And the State Department and the head of the system said to us, our kids are not participating in the educational programming that we're offering. Less than 10% of our kids are involved in signing up and participating. We need some help, can you help us? We said, sure. So, you know, what we ended up doing was designing through Minecraft a competition where kids had to critically think, work in teams, do coding, put things up on the internet through a variety of different platforms where they used Minecraft to build the COVID-19 virus, to go ahead and build the COVID home that they would want to live in, to build the COVID hospital they would want to be treated in. In less than 30 days, we had 3,200 plus students from middle school and high school participating. It became the gateway to that school system to re-engaging kids back into learning in the most difficult times for them. Through things like that, I've had the pleasure of, of working with Max and uh, the Immortals. We're doing things all around the country, not just about how to help kids understand the game and the design and the like that you think technologically that makes sense to people, but the streaming, the shoutcasting, the event managers, the coaches, the mentors, doing the coding, doing the analytics where people are learning statistics and calculus without thinking that's what they're doing. So we've seen a huge uptake in evolution and a real nexus and connection between the teams, the industry, and the pipeline that can be created for a student's opportunity through that system. Yeah, and I would actually just like to add to that um, it's organizations like CSUDH Esports and other collegiate clubs and activities that really help to build that student engagement. Um, it's been especially difficult during the pandemic to personalize your college experience, right? Um, so I personally transferred into quarantine. I came to Dominguez Hills when there was no physical classes. And it, the Esports Association became my way to interact with my peers, uh, learn about what they're doing, their career paths, and how I can become a better student, right? So these, the, organi the organization, uh, the industry itself has become a way to build on student engagement and student participation because it's reaching them in a place where they are already at. It's become that halfway point. I would, I would just add that young people today are communicating more through gaming and platforms connected to gaming than they are communicating through social media. Social media has become predominantly a publishing platform and it's essentially a small number of publishers and an enormous number of viewers. But in terms of engagement, communication, connection, socialization, that's happening in-game, and it's happening on a platform I'm sure most in the room um, know of, which is Discord. Um, that's where the people in our broadly defined global population are connecting really under the age of 25. And, and that's it, that's what's driving it. And, and gaming, as I said earlier, is the leading industry driving that activity. And, and an increasing amount of that activity is connected to competitive gaming, which is where there's an opportunity to fuel the growth of esports. Since we're talking about the present, I'm just gonna skip ahead to the future and then we'll go back to the present <laughs> for a bit. You know, we've talked about the ecosystem as it exists right now. Um, but in your opinion, and whoever wants can jump on this and then we, we can keep going, what is the future of esports look like? You know, we're seeing things like the metaverse, you know, words like the meta words versus NFTs. How, what it, how is that playing in right now and where do you see just the future of esports going? I think you've got two people here better positioned to answer that than me, but I do want to talk about how that ecosystem will span out. Because I think when, when you've touched on things like the metaverse and Matt referenced it earlier, like people still have a hard time defining that. I mean, three years ago in South Korea, they started building an entire city to be the like destination, the entertainment destination of the Southern Hemisphere. If you lived within a four hour flight of South Korea, this is where you had to go. That was the intention of building this city. And that city was essentially a giant strip mall 
but a high-end one, using a lot of AR, VR, having everything very connected, like a miniature smart city, and it was all being driven by gaming, by virtual art, and by content creators, which is exactly what a couple of people on this panel are touching on. What you see, though, is that influence. You, know, you think back you know, decades ago, and people you say, what's the military doing? That will influence what's happening next. Now everyone, every, like, 100% of the Fortune 500 are EY's clients. And every single company that we have in an advisory sense wants to know. I can't tell you the amount of times I've had the conversation of 101, what is esports? What is gaming? What's the ecosystem look like? And then how do you tap into it? They all want to know where it's going, how they can, how they can play in it. So you're going to see, you see already today, but it's touching more on the future with this metaverse concept. When you're living a, a more controlled and democratized two-star life, like real world and, and digital, and it's combined, you're going to see uh, extensions of what you've touched on already. So companies today look for the data, right? How are people playing games, and how did the attributes of those games connect to what my workforce needs? Mm -hmm. Strategy games, if you're really, really good at any of the strategy games at a competitive sense, you've got all the consulting firms and probably some banks knocking on your door asking what you're doing after college. You know, so you're seeing it from a recruitment point of view, and then you're also seeing it from a technology adoption point of view. You've got all the biggest healthcare institutions looking at what other, what other players in gaming and esports doing, what happens in that game, and how can we adapt that for healthcare? How can we gamify our industry, essentially? So it's really interesting where it's going. Uh, and in terms of like the purest internal view, I think there's, like I said, two people who can answer that better than I have. If I can add to that, one of the things that esports and gaming is doing is it's creating innovators and entrepreneurs and critical thinkers. One of the things that has led this country um, for many, many years are those skill sets and capacities. And you're starting to see countries around the world wanting to emulate it. You know, there are some entities out there that can regurgitate and, and do things in a very linear fashion. But what esports and gaming is doing, as you've alluded to, is it's creating that next generation of what workforce needs. And what Matt talked about when you talk about all of the sponsors of esports, they don't do it just for the ROI. They're doing it also because they really envision and can see the value proposition of what those individuals can provide to them in their future. And it's about how do you help individuals thrive, grow, be the best they can be, be productive citizens, be productive family members, et cetera. Esports is that vehicle that's providing the pathways for those kind of creativities and opportunities that really, a short time ago, we were wondering how are we gonna keep our edge as a country and as a society in what we do, this is really that innovation level that's really spurring the next growth of economy that Matt's alluded to in everything that he's talked about in his keynote. Um, I, I think that what everyone is kind of alluding to in some degree is that esports and gaming are, are the future of esports and gaming is that they're going to be everywhere um, and integrated into everything. Um, there are esports, our competitors are signing professional athletes who are signed already to professional teams. Um, they are not competing on their esports teams, but they're representing that esports org. We are signing creators, as I mentioned, who are, again, not going to compete on our competitor teams, but are going to represent immortals to their fan base and hopefully convert their fans to become fans, their, their followers to become fans of our teams. Um, we have one of our competitors, um, and this is, I'm super envious of this because I think it's super creative, but one of our competitors is partnered with McDonald's and they, McDonald's was going through a period of time where they, were, they hit COVID and they were having trouble retaining employees and, and their competitor said, let's create an esports league. You know, you're not going to Lakers games anymore, let's create an internal esports league and you, this McDonald's can compete against this McDonald's. Can, there, there are 75 McDonald's involved in this esports league now and it's a great branded product that they've sold to a partner. That's esports. I mean, they're not competing professionally, but that's esports. I mean, there's a difference between esports and gaming, and competition is not involved in every level of gaming, and that's fine. People are watching it. That's the content. That's the different space. That's the broader space. That's the space that Immortals wants to invade and, and begin to steal market share from. Um, but that's the future of esports: is that it, it's literally going to be everywhere. I mean, you're, I mean, 
I think it's with mobile gaming, it's it's happening. With the metaverse, it's happening. It's happening in so many different ways. And and esports teams are just trying to really figure out how we can grow our audience and and expand into these territories authentically. Um, and I think that really the authenticity really really matters. Lots of incredible things happening, as you're saying. It's everywhere, and it's going to be even more everywhere <laughs> in the future. Um, focusing on you know just how big the industry now and the internal development and workforce that you need to keep this industry growing. And I actually want to start with Alex from the student perspective. What are you seeing from the students' perspective in terms of the interest in esports? What are the students looking to get involved in? What kind of jobs are they looking for? Essentially, what is the student desire you're seeing here for the esports industry? Yeah, surprisingly, um, not all of us want to be professional competitors in esports. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of my fellow students in the CSUDH Esports Association want to be content creators or work on the digital side in film or uh, graphic design, game development, or even myself, I would love to continue to use esports competition as a way to build communities in schools for those students. Um, so I think that it's, go it's a very broad um, professional development um, entity. <laughs> so it's really exciting to see it from that point of view. Um, and I think we'll continue to see more students become teachers and esports coaches just based off of their experience in the collegiate esports space. I want to just note one thing is that Graham mentioned that he has massive brands coming to him with no idea how to enter the space and and you're talking about the the level of knowledge and integration that that students have in the space and i'm sitting here kind of i came into the esports industry as a marketer but not as a lifetime gamer and i just can't i want to just emphasize the value of people like alex uh, who know these games and these communities because um, the hello fellow kids meme of brands trying to enter the space inauthentically and without credibility is everywhere and it's really, it is not, it's not well received in gaming. Um, there are very few communities where it will be less <laughs> well received. Um, and so as esports orgs and as gaming companies, we are looking for people who know these communities intimately and are a part of these communities, not just professional people who have skills and can make a video, but people who make, can make a video that gamers are going to connect with and really on an emotional level. If I can add something to that, and that is what we're really providing through this industry is the concept of digital portfolios for students. Colleges, workforce, et cetera, you know, there are a thousand people applying for high quality jobs. It's really, what have you done for me? What have you demonstrated? What have you created? What have you been able to showcase? And what's your digital portfolio? The people who put on the events, the people who do the streaming, the people that go ahead and did the fandom art, the people who created the website and the merch and sold the merch. Um, those are all skill sets that industry in all facets are looking for. It's not just what have you learned, but demonstrate what is it that you have created and done. And what esports and gaming is providing is the creation and the opportunity for students to showcase their learning, which is a really unique opportunity. I think most industries, most industries have that. I mean, if you any in, in sports Instagram, like House of Highlights, I mean, like they they, they establish that way, but gaming is, there's so much more territory. There's almost an infinite, it's not an infinite number, but there are so many games. Um, and there are so many different, so many people playing these games. So the audience is massive and the opportunity is huge. We just, I followed this kid on LinkedIn because he was doing an eSports weekly show. Um, and I watched it for about six months, and then I was like, you know what, we're gonna do some content with this guy, and now we have a content series with him on our TikTok, um, where he's kind of taking, taking his lens that he looks at the industry, where he talks about the, the, the different deals that have been signed and sponsorships that have been signed, and he's, he's, for us, he's diving into different, a specific subject in gaming and teaching people about it, and it's doing well on our TikTok. And I think that, you know, as an org, that's, that's really what we, wanted, what we wanna be doing. Yeah, I mean, if, if the idea of content creation hasn't been driven home yet, one of our attorneys is the top creator representing attorneys in the US, and that is her specialty. She represents 
creators or companies that represent creators in that space. Um, I want to go to the career opportunities because there's so much, and we often focus on, as we were talking about, just the professional, but as Max and Alex alluded to, there's so many other career opportunities, like Max is in marketing. Some of us are in the outside professional space. Can, um, I'm going to throw this to Max and Matt to talk about the just like, the range of career opportunities that exist, whether in people you've worked with or internally within your own organizations, and where you're seeing the most need. Let's say Max first or Matt first? I'm a little sorry. confusing. Matt no, I heard first. both, kidding, but I've been talking kidding. a lot. I'm go. sorry, I'm I'm I'll go Matt first. and Graham. I'm looking at you. <laughs> e either way. Uh, so uh, one thing just to kind of connect the prior comments to answering this question. Um, I, I talked about uh, the, the connections that are built between gamers. Gaming is so omnipresent. It's such a dominant part of culture that wherever you work, wherever you, whatever company you start, I guarantee you that gaming will be a common interest among a significant percentage of your colleagues or your employees. So that means that you as an organization, you as a company, you need to embrace gaming. You need to embrace the recognition of that culture as having an influence on society and the work that you're going to do, partially because of the skill sets that were referenced earlier. If you're a, a strategy gamer, you might have a unique approach to consulting. All of that rings true, and gaming can be a source of it and a source of bonding. Um, and positivity within your organization. In terms of the types of roles, there's no end. I mean, there really is no end. And, and when we look for people, um, we are looking for people who understand some aspect of gaming, some connection to it. Uh, for me, I gamed when I was younger. I've been connected to gaming at different points in my career, but it was really when my son started playing Minecraft that I got back into gaming, and that's what we did. We played Minecraft together for hours on weekends, and now I am committed to the industry because of that, because I saw what positivity it created in his life and, and what joy it brought me to connect to him around that. And so when we look for people, we're looking for some type of uh, relationship between their interests, their passions, and their skill sets, and that zeitgeist around gaming. And it doesn't matter if we're looking for a marketer, or a content creator, an editor, a, uh, an event producer, an engineer. And in fact, when we welcome new people into the company with an email, part of that email is just about what are their favorite games? And, and everybody has one, even if it's a game they play casually and it happens to be Candy Crush. Everybody has a favorite game. And so it really, it really is something that's connected uh, across society and, and is part of, of, our, of our culture on every level. So it informs hiring and management of a workforce across the board. So we um, want to go to audience Q&A uh, really soon, but there is one more question I have to ask that's near and dear to my heart at least, and that is, um, especially with what's been happening in the news cycle, is how do we make sure we're also building a pipeline for diverse talent to enter the esports and gaming community? I'll actually speak on that one quickly. Um, I think that it's really important to get people of color women gamers and those with disabilities engaged early in esports and allow them to understand that they are part of that community. Um, a lot of the times, I know I've experienced it, uh, we get left out just by accident, just because we're not considered part of that central group of perhaps white guys who are around my age and have never experienced um, true disconnect from their peers due to that. Um, and it's really natural for, the, for there to be just clicks of um, people who have had similar experiences. And it's really important that we engage people early and m ensure that they are put in positions where they're seen and heard so that we can continue to get those students who, or children who may have been um, struggling to get engaged 
they need to see people who are like them and who can mentor them and who understand their plight. I think it's, yeah, I, I would completely agree. And I think it's about access and opportunity. Um, and I think it's, it's there, there are so many, so many issues, to, to, but it, you know, there's also infrastructure. Um, there, there was, <laughs> I've been thinking about this a lot, but we were working with Bud Light to put on a, an NBA 2K tournament and they got about 100, under 100,000, under 1,000 viewers. Um, but I also talk with this organization called Community who has an NBA 2K league with HBCUs and they're getting hundreds of thousands of viewers because they have access to the audience and they can speak authentically to them and they know them. Um, I think that for esports, you know, esports need, you know, there needs to be access to the, the biggest games and to the ability to land, land, the development of land centers so people can go in and play games like League of Legends that require extensive and expensive equipment to play. Um, those are those are popping up all over the country, which is really really exciting. But I think that um, giving access to those and making those free for use, I think, is a huge piece. And I think we have to remember that esports is not just about the myopic vision of the player. It's really about the holistic ecosystem. It's the streamer, the shoutcaster, the fandom art person, the game designer, the coder, um, the event manager, etc. Out of our 2,000 plus clubs, 67% of the presidents of our clubs are women. We have over 45% of the members of our clubs who are women. And that's because it's not just about the competitive player. Where do they find a space and a place to feel a sense of belonging, to feel part of something, to be affirmed, to be accepted for who they are? So they may be, as we've talked about, the casual gamer, maybe Candy Crush or whatever it may be, but they see a space and a place where they can belong and feel valued and where they can go ahead and take what it is their passion around the ecosystem of gaming and esports and take advantage of moving that forward in a sense of community. It's really an obligation, right? I mean, it, it's, there is commercial opportunity associated with it, but it is an obligation. We take it seriously, and what you just described um, is uh, reflective of a, a program that we created called Galentine's Games in partnership with Riot Games, uh, where it, uh, we uh, run and produce an all-female non-binary tournament for uh, semi-pro and top amateur players, and we actually received an award for it um, this year as the best diversity initiative in esports. And it, and it is that all-encompassing experience where every person involved in the tournament uh, was either a, a woman or non-binary individual. So whether they were producing the content, on-screen shoutcasting, playing in it, producing the event, marketing the event, et cetera. And it's that type of program that companies have an obligation to create um, to really celebrate diversity in this space and let all um, player communities know that you know they deserve a, a space, they are welcome in this industry, and they're helping to really drive its success. I do, I do want to jump in. I know we've got to go to the Q&A, but just on that, there is a lot of work to be done by everyone, right? But we have seen people, st especially the last couple years, when things, and this, this speaks to the influence of gaming and esports, when these topics started to come to light with gaming and esports, <clears throat> ESG and diversity and accessibility became serious conversations in the workforce. It, it's a lag, but it happened. Gaming starts talking about it, businesses start talking about it. And it's because of that influence, it's because of the, the critical mass of people and engagement and money and all of those things. But, <clears throat> pardon me, the fact that it happens is really valuable. So when we speak with clients now, specifically now coming out of the pandemic and considering what's happened the last three years, we have, we have clients asking us, how do, we, how do we be more inclusive? How do we increase access? And how do we tap into this market? You know, there's all these different things they want to do. We've got initiatives, we want growth, we want to like make a better world and we want to like cut costs and all these things that contradict and some complement. But what's really interesting, as a couple practical examples, we now have our own sort of, uh, we call it a NCOE, so Neurodiverse Center of Excellence. And it came out of our gaming practice because we saw a lot of people on the neurodiverse spectrum who were really amazing at pattern recognition and reflex time and hyper-focus and all these type of things. And so now we, we have a whole 
center of excellence around this with hundreds of people employed who are identified as being on the neurodiverse spectrum. And we have clients who come to us saying, how do I set that up for myself? And others come into us say, how can we, how can we pay you to use your neurodiverse talent for whatever consulting engagements we have? And then the last piece being that, that drive that it also pushes and the changes it pushes out into um, technology to help those initiatives. You wouldn't believe it, and it's not something that's normally associated with Ernst & Young, but we now have a whole team working on brain-computer interfaces to increase workforce accessibility for people who don't have full faculty because of the conversations that have come out of things like gaming and esports. Like, I think that's pretty powerful to the message, and to tra trace that back, it needs to keep being worked on. We need that accessibility and that coverage for people because that's driven already such a huge thing. I couldn't quantify the monetary value of that in the market, but the social value is just something we all recognize, and I think that's really powerful. Yeah, you hit on an um, important point, and a great example of this is when the, the state of California decided to make an example of companies with the Me Too movement, they went after the gaming companies, which, and they rarely ever sue companies in their own name. Um, just as an example. All right, I want to make sure we get to audience Q&A. Um, who, uh, we'll have someone going around with a mic. Um, there you are, great. And uh, who has questions? Let's go, let's start over here since it's closest to you. Uh, hi there, my name is Tyler Wolbert. Um, one of the questions I had to ask was, Along the lines of fighting games and also sports as well, historically, most of the things in esports and sports, they've always been team-based. But when it comes to one-on-one -on -one things, more intimate things, they've always been less popular. So with the inclusion of fighting games as well as team games, what do you guys think of that as well as you know, implementing something where people can shine on their own with, with the competitive scene? I think they... This is not necessarily related to gaming and to those specific games, but I think that influencers and creators and certain individual athletes within esports are certainly proof that there is ability to build an individual brand in this industry. Um, I, we are not currently in fighting games, but we're keeping a close eye on the fighting game that Riot is developing, um, and, and that's an area of interest for us. Um, I won't say that it's not something, not, no, there, there aren't communities that we're interested in or, or have eyes on. It's, not, it's just not a space that we're in at, at the current moment. I think that for us, as I said, it's really about, it's really about identifying opportunities that are going to give us scale and new audience. Um, certainly, there's opportunity it, with that, given that we're not in those games. And I don't think there's a lot of crossover with our MOBAs and FPS games. So um, not, not, not announcing Immortals in, in, <laughs> kind of entering those games right now. But um, it's, it, you know, I don't, the other thing I would add is that the, the competitive infrastructure around those games, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with, but um, that's another uh, kind of area that we would need to evaluate before entering that game. However, um, we are not opposed to entering games just from a creator or influencer standpoint. And so if there are individuals building their brand and we feel like we can align with them through our partnerships or just through Brand, growing our brand, that's something we'd be interested in as well. Um, so an interesting space, but not one we're currently in. I'm going to make you exercise today. I'm sorry. Or we have someone there? Oh, great. I thought I was going to make you exercise. <laughs> All right, let's go to a question there. Hello, Johnny Fong here. Um, my question is actually for Alex. When will uh, CSU Domingo Stills Esports host a competition in this theater on that stage? And would you uh, want to compete against CSU Northridge? Yes. Uh, Toros, Toros versus Matador? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, we'll ha take much pleasure in wiping you on our home turf. No, no, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not from uh, CSU Northridge. They're friends of mine. I'm from Los Angeles Mission College, and uh, I'm starting a certificate program on, on uh, eSports events management. So we host events on theater, in stages uh, in theaters like this, so we'd like to host one with you. Yeah, it's definitely uh, in the future. We've, we've uh, been talking about it as things have been opening up more and more. Let's go um, to the back. This question is for Matt. Uh, my name is Craig Carroll, and I'm a producer of uh, products uh, for gaming, the gaming industry. 
Uh, and I'm curious, you talked about advertising in game, but do you see an opportunity for advertising? Like if we create modified consoles or modified uh, grips, thumb grips and things like that, it, you know, advertising in that way, do you think the, uh, the industry is ready for that? Well, it, it, in some ways, it, it is happening. Uh, you know, Logitech has been one of our partners, and they've done uh, branded gear. Um, and so I do think that that is an opportunity. I, I, I suspect that it will really be dependent upon tapping into the existing manufacturers and getting them excited about essentially sponsored gear or branded gear because they have the infrastructure, the dis distribution pipelines, particularly right now with supply chain issues. They're the ones who are commanding the majority of, um, uh, you know, the, um, the materials and the workforce and the factory work that's going to be able to get that product made and brought to market. Um, so I do think it's an opportunity. I think it's a little bit more piecemeal than being able to get into a popular gaming title with a brand. Um, but I, I certainly would encourage you to talk to the HyperXs, the Logitechs, the Dells, and um, you know the right op the right value proposition, uh, something that helps them think they're going to sell more items, more SKUs, uh, they'll be all over it. Yeah, I mean, the HyperX, we actually reached out to to be on this panel because of all the gear they create for gaming. Um, my headphones are HyperX headphones, one of the best headphones I've ever owned. <laughs> so gaming has some pretty amazing gear specific to it. Um, let's go to the middle, maybe right there. Hey everyone, I'm Romeo Blancas, and I just had a question about um, health and wellness in esports. So, you know, as esports grows, we'll see a lot more young people enter the scene to become professional gamers. But uh, in the past and in the present now, we also see a lot of professional esports athletes retire in their 20s. You know, what kind of strategies is the industry um, going after to help, you know, the, with health, um, health and wellness and to elongate um, a player's career? So I'm going to answer it if I can a little bit from the education perspective. The curriculum that we built and developed was created by um, professors and educators at the University of California at Irvine and the Orange County Department of Education. In particular, we have an entire component uh, around health and wellness that was created by the schools of public health and the schools of medicine at the University of California at Irvine. So when we have our clubs, we do our club meetings, it's really about inculcation. It's about making it part of their daily activity. It's just like anything else. If you want to be healthy, you've got to think it, you've got to live it, you've got to be it, et cetera. So we start out um, teaching kids about mind-body activities, about yoga, those kinds of things. We don't do it as if it's unidirectional and, you know, the parent or the teacher standing up there and said, you need to do yoga or you need to exercise or you need to drink 64 ounces of water every day. We do it from the perspective that, you know, when you look at all athletes around the world, they have a regiment about how well they take care of themselves, their body and their mind. You know, you look at someone like, not putting it, you know, a, a, a figure that this person is being the epitome of it, but someone like Tom Brady, who has a strict regimen about his health and wellness, how he operates, how he lives, et cetera, that allows for his longevity to be able to continue to play and be a better human being. How do you integrate that into the learning and the play at the same time is a core piece of what we're, for example, trying to do. We have I'm sorry, go ahead, Max. I was just going to add that we have a, a head of performance for our, for our professional teams that we've also extended to the creators who are assigned to our brand that d deals with kind of uh, both mental and physical well-being for the gamers and, and, and speaks with them about kind of ongoing issues and helps them work through them. So um, that's a resource that we provide, among other things. Yeah, I know a lot of organizations also have gyms within their facilities, um, so that's part of something that they're looking at. We have time for one more question. I'm going to go up front right here. Over the question. Hello, Emilio Sosa, Los Nietos Elementary School District. Uh, we talked about access and diversity, and 100% agree with you. Um, we also talked about credibility. We're looking at uh, kicking off an esports program in our school district. Uh, when it comes to credibility and entering the esports world, what advice would you have for the school district that's looking to come in 
to add the access to diversity, but also come in with credibility so that the program is strong long term. I think part of what you need to do is look at the research. There's really good, strong data around the connection of play and learning. It's one of the things that Cal State Dominguez Hills is working on now around connecting and research. It's really been the core of our work. Uh, we spent four years um, through an IRB-approved uh, evaluation and assessment done by Dr. Steinkuller, Mimi Ito, Katie Salen, I mean, true leaders in research and education um, around the world that have published uh, significant papers around the nexus between play and learning. That's what administrators want to hear, that's what teachers want to hear, and more importantly, that's what parents want to hear. They want to know it's not just what sometimes people refer to as thumb monkeys, that there's really a trajectory and an opportunity and there's hardcore IRB approved data to support what that looks like. That's where I would begin because that's what your colleagues are looking for before they jump into something that really in many ways is unknown and uncomfortable for them. There's one other part, other part of credibility because I think you nailed it from the standpoint of, of uh, faculty, staff, and, and district-wide um, representatives who are considering what to fund, but the credibility for the students. And, and the credibility for the students is going to be dependent on one primary thing, and that is having the faculty who are involved in running that program be gamers. They have to be gamers, they have to know how to talk to the students, they have to be willing to play or be committed to playing the games or constructing the environments, but being in those spaces with the students, and that's not something that a non-gamer is gonna be able to do. The students will recognize that instantly, they'll tune out, they won't come back the next week, they won't wanna talk about it at home. You have to have people who inspire those kids to make gaming a permissible conversation at dinner with their parents because of their enthusiasm when they get home at the end of the day. And so that is the credibility factor you need to develop on the side of the students. All right, I wanna give a great round of applause for our amazing panelists. I mean, these are people really at the top of the industry. Thank you. And thank you, Irene, so much for moderating this panel. Again, a big round of applause for everyone here on stage. Thank you all so much. My name is Melissa Cam, and I'm the Vice President of Strategic Relations for the LAEDC. And I have to say, we put on a series of future forums such like this every year. This has been my favorite one because probably unlike most of you in this audience, I know the world of video games from growing up. Uh, however, my 40-something-year-old husband, my seven-year-old daughter, and my nine-year-old son are all into esports. So Roblox, Minecraft, Animal Crossing, they are very much into it. Robux, Robux is at the top of their Christmas list this year. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say a few quick things before we close out our wonderful event for this evening. Uh, my colleague, Judy Kruger, if you don't mind waving, is in the audience today. Judy leads our Digital Media and Entertainment Industry Cluster Council for the LAEDC. So I encourage you, um, those that are into esports, those that are in the industry, to please connect with Judy or myself at the end of this evening. Uh, again, just want to thank all of you so much. I want to give a special shout out to Ruben Caputo. Is he still in the audience? Thank you. Ruben is the eSports General Manager and Academic Advisor here at Cal State University Dominguez Hills. So a big thank you. Uh, thank you so much to Nixon Peabody, one of our LAEDC members. And finally, uh, Dr. Parham, thank you so much for having us, hosting us this morning, all the staff and the team here, the eSports Association. Um, we thank you so much for being here this morning and supporting the future of esports here in Los Angeles specifically, as we know it drives our workforce development and also our economy. So thank you all so much for coming out this morning and please drive safely, it may or may not be raining, <laughs> but thank you all for coming again this morning.